Uh, hello, uh, my name is Matt. Today I'm going to be presenting a little bit about how we use reactive websockets to make a code fly. So, myself, I am a junior majoring in computer science, minor in linguistics. Uh, I'm also a team captain this year for RE Autonomous. Uh, I'll talk a little bit later about what that is. I've been involved in the club since my freshman year. Um, I led a sub team last year. This year, I'm fully in charge, so that's fun. Uh, on top of that, when I'm not doing that stuff, I'm involved in Rutgers Dance Marathon, where I'm going to give my little plug here. If you're going to participate in Rutgers Dance Marathon, which I really suggest you do, register a dance by Monday when the registration closes. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, I'm a fan of the Rucker Scarlet Knights. I can say that with a straight face now. Uh, I do geocaching, and I really care about tactics. Um, we are, are you autonomous? So this is a competition team under the umbrella of the AIAA here at Rutgers. The AIAA is a professional society for aerospace engineers. Um, here at Rutgers, we have three different competition teams. Uh, one of them does a more traditional aerospace uh, sort of curriculum. One of them does a rocketry program. Uh, our competition team does autonomous drones. So this is a really sort of a holistic, I hate that word, a holistic uh, systems engineering approach where uh, we get a lot of different people from aerospace, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and computer science all together uh, to do a really cool Really cool competition that I'll talk a little bit about. Um, we have we break that into four sub teams. We have an imaging team and an autopilot team, and we have two uh, hardware-oriented teams. Uh, one that does we just call it hardware, but that's the the main aircraft, and then one that is in charge of the airdrop task in our competition. Um, so the competition uh, is put on by the another professional organization called the Student Amend Aerial. Systems competition. That's the name of the competition. Um, professional organization is uh, another long acronym thing. Um, they do. Uh, they they put on a competition to allow us to build an autonomous drone to complete tasks, including waypoint navigation, obstacle avoidance, object detection, and uh, air delivery. Um, so today I'm going to be talking more about these first two tasks um, and how what the system we built to solve those tasks. Uh, and then we're judged based on our mission demonstration, uh, the documentation that we submit, and our overall how we work as a team of operational excellence. Um, so first let's look at like what the requirements are of the system that I'm going to describe. Um, so we can talk about uh, our mission requirements. So these include things like uh, the, the flight plan that we actually have to start by flying through. Um, so basically when we take off, they give us a list of waypoints and we have to navigate through those waypoints uh, within a minimum of 100 feet of each of those waypoints. Um, we follow this path before we're allowed to complete any of the other tasks. So last year this path had us going all the way around the entire boundary of the competition uh, field. Um, and so we, we have to build a mission that allows us to do that. Um, we have about 15 minutes. So we have a minimum of 15 minutes to uh, plan our mission out. In actuality, it turns out that we have a little bit more time than that. Um, we uh, also are given these obstacles. So these yellow cylinders here are obstacles. And some of these obstacles actually are in this like waypoint path. And then some of these obstacles are, can also impact us if we're going to attempt the airdrop or the imaging uh, portion of the competition. Uh, we have to make sure we route around this obstacle as well. And then also we can't fly outside of the flight boundary. So any mission that we plan uh, needs to be sure that we don't fly outside of this red line here. Um, other sort of constraints that we have, uh, we use an autopilot that uses something called the Mavlink protocol. We just have to be sure our system can also use that protocol. Uh, and we also have to communicate with the judges server. So the judges have a web server that gives us a specification for what those waypoints are, what those obstacles are. We have to make sure that we can quickly and accurately uh, get those, get that information so we can identify our path. Um, 
So here's a screenshot from our existing navigation system that we were working with. Um, it's, it's, it, it is very fully featured. It does a lot of different things. It doesn't really do exactly what we need it to do. So for one thing, it doesn't communicate with the judge's server. It doesn't also, also it doesn't have a way to route around obstacles. Um, and it's also a little bit more finicky to use. I have to like do a lot of right clicking to get things to do like what I need to do. Not very streamlined when we're working under the time constraint. So uh, we need to build something that's a little bit more automated. Uh, we need to build something that can actually see the waypoints and obstacles that the judges give us so we know how to plan our mission without those obstacles. And we need to be able to quickly and accurately edit our mission. And it would also really be nice to actually see how the plane is responding to the mission that we give it. Um, it's, it's just cool to watch the plane as it goes in real time. And then we're able to adequately judge if we uh, hit those obstacles or not, if we're following the path that they give us or not. Um, so to talk a little bit about how we developed the solution from more of a, a high level review, um, there are a bunch of technologies that we ended up using. Uh, these are the ones that uh, our team was confident with at the beginning. Uh, these are the ones that we learned along the way. So um, I'm not going to talk about the back end in this presentation, but we did use uh, Python and Django uh, to build that back end. Um, this is because of the existing back end that we already had to accomplish a different part of the competition. Uh, we just said we can bolt on our parts to that. Uh, we know JavaScript. Um, so if you, if you want to follow along a little bit in this presentation, that uh, I also kind of assume you know JavaScript at least a little bit. Um, and then we know reactive Redux. Uh, these are two technologies I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'm also going to talk about WebSockets, which was a, a thing that was totally open, brand new to us. Um, but we learned it was actually kind of easy to, to get along with. Um, we didn't know how to actually plot things on a map. Uh, we didn't know what it was like to build like a really big thing in React, just like kind of like small things. Uh, and then eventually we, we also started to learn TypeScript, uh, which is a way to help manage that complexity of a large scale React application. So instead of having JavaScript, which is like very loose with types, you're able to use TypeScript, which is a little bit more traditionally like something like Java that allows you to define uh, static types for your stuff. So, um, without further ado, let's talk a little bit about what React is. Uh, does anyone know anything about React here? No, a little bit, a little bit, okay. Um, so, I have a few adjectives to describe React. The first one is functional. React, um, you can think of it as one big function that takes two things. It takes a component tree, um, so, that's what you're going to build up of like the little small parts of your app. You build them up into a larger uh, tree of, the, of a bunch of things. Um, and then also your application state. And so your application state is your uh, sort of like everything that the user is doing. Like everything that, that differentiates one instance of your application from the next. So um, if I start typing into a text box, that's a piece of application state. If I have a drop down, pull down, that might be some application state. Uh, a bunch of different things. Um, it takes those two things, it combines them, and it outputs uh, a static HTML page on your site. Um, so yeah, the component tree, as I kind of said, it, it's built up using a bunch of nested function calls. So um, it, it's very modular. It, it, you kind of behind a bunch of things. I'll show you a little bit about what that's like. Um, another thing is that React is mostly only for display logic. Um, so it's, this HTML is all about the display, how the display is actually looking on your page. Um, the component tree is um, a layout written in something called JSX, which I'll talk a little bit about as well. Um, and the app state that can be computed however you want. So that, so how you compute your app state is usually where you find all the business logic. Um, so stuff like if I am, uh, if I made a request for some information from a server, I haven't gotten it yet, 
then maybe my app state might say that, that the request is like loading. And then once, as soon as I get that new object, then this app state now says that the request is not loading. Um, that's like a whole piece of logic. Um, that's really not about what React is about. Um, and I'll talk a little, uh, later I'll show you what Redux is. That is where you actually define your application state. That's where you define more of that business logic is what we call it. So this is only about uh, taking your application state and then displaying it to the user somehow. So this app state is, can be computed however you want uh, in a different way than the faculties that React gives you. Um, does that kind of make sense? Do I, should I go over that a little more? Okay. Um, And then uh, I, I talked a little bit about JSX, um, and really the best way I can sh uh, show you JSX is just through example. But um, a little bit about how that works. Um, your browser doesn't actually know what JSX is, but uh, this other thing called Babel knows how to translate your JSX into JavaScript. And your browser knows how to run JavaScript, just like any uh, browser like that. So. Um, Let's just jump into a demo. That, that might have been a little much, uh, but if you open up this link, uh, it is case sensitive. Uh, you can follow along with me. Um, it's bit.ly slash capital M A T T, my name, and then two capital H H for hacker hour, and then the new one. Okay. Load it up so if you load that up, uh, you should see this. Uh, could you just show the link again, real quick? Uh, yeah, it's Matt HH1. Yeah, Matt HH1. see this on the screen? Um, so a few things to point out immediately. Uh, and does everyone have app.js open? You, if, if it's not open, you might need to go into your files. Uh, you click the source folder here, and then you click on app.js. Um, there's a little bit more that I can show you a little later. Um, but right now, let's just stick to app.js. Uh, if you get lost, I also included some intermediate steps along the way. Um, so you, if, if you get lost and you want to try to uh, catch back up, you can open up uh, step one.js, copy that into app.js, and then uh, run it again. Um, and, and then you'll hopefully be caught up. Uh, but also, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to, to go slow and let you ask questions for sure, too. Um, so a few things to point out already. Um, we're importing React. That's the main library. Um, we actually, we're not actually using the word React anywhere else in this code, but uh, that points out to the compiler that uh, we are using this JSX syntax. So uh, this is actually a JavaScript file, but it has these angly brackets that look like HTML. Is, is everyone familiar with HTML? Or kind yeah. of familiar? Okay, good. Um, so like here we have a div, here we have a header. Um, if I just start writing some more HTML, I can do something like a marquee. Uh, so, uh, so the cool thing about this environment is that it actually starts to um, run your code as you type it. Um, and right now it's saying, hey, what's up with this? You have an opening marquee tag, but you don't have a closing marquee tag. So by uh, just like any usual HTML, I can just type the, uh, the opening bracket, close bracket for the start tag, and then the opening bracket slash RP for the closing tag. Um, and so now it renders this scroll thing. 
Uh, Marquee is not part of React. Marquee is just a funny little uh, HTML tag that was really old. No one uses it now because um, it looks ugly. But uh, I, I think it has a little fun to it. Um, so that's that's all good. Does anyone have any questions here? So that's all fun. Um, but it, you know, this is just like a stack page. There's really nothing differentiating this from just writing this into some HTML file and displaying that to the user. Uh, how are we going to actually um, use this? Or how, are we, how are we actually going to use React to, to do some real application work here? So um, to do that, I'm going to first import a new uh, thing from the React library. So uh, it's called use, uh, sorry, use state. And so to import that, I, I started with an opening curly brace here. So okay, so I did comma, then opening curly brace, and then use state closing curly brace. So this is a new function from the React library uh, that's uh, not included inside of this big React thing. So um, if you did that right, that should say uh, it, it's here, but we didn't use it yet. Uh, so let's let's go ahead and use it in the application. Uh, from there. We type const, um, and then brackets. So, so this is like a list, like the, the square brackets. Uh, and then I'm going to say toggled, comma, set toggled. And that's equal to use state or false. OK, so this is a whole weird incantation. But what that does is it tells React, hi, I want a new piece of state that when uh, I update this piece of state, then you need to re-render this component for me. So uh, app itself is this big, is this whole function. Uh, like I said, uh, React uh, tree is composed of a bunch of nested function calls. So app itself is this component. Uh, I'm telling React that when I update the state by uh, running the set toggle command, then you need to help me by uh, re reloading this whole state, or by reloading this whole component. So um, the false itself, that is the default value for the state. So at the first time this component is built, that state is going to be uh, false. So, so toggle will equal false. Set toggle is a function that I can uh, tell it uh, what to set toggle to after that. So um, to show that in action, I'm going to create a button. So I start with the open uh, button close, and then I, I give the button a name, or yeah, hello. So now, now you should see this button on the screen. Uh, it doesn't really do much quite yet. Um, so to make it do something, I, I give it this uh, on-click um, property. So uh, the thing about React is that it, it sort of augments this HTML by letting you add new uh, handlers to uh, different things. So I can say, I can, the, I'm basically telling React, hey, when I click the button, I need you to do this for me. Um, so to do that, I give it a function. And so this is a function declaration, this uh, opening close paren, and then that's an equal sign, and then a uh, greater than symbol. So that makes like a, a, an arrow type thing. Um, and, and so when I click on this button, I want to set toggled. And I want to set it to the value of whatever toggled was, except flipped. So I want you to set toggle to the opposite toggle. Um, and finally, I'm just going to display toggle. And to do that, uh, you put in this these curly braces and then toggle. Did everyone see that? Everyone, is anyone like totally lost right now? No? Cool. Um, so if I hit save on that, uh, I'm going to upgrade. OK, uh, that's not going to quite work. OK, so, so 
React actually doesn't display Boolean values. So, so basically I'm saying um, I want you to display the value of, of this in, in this, um, after the button, then display that. Um, and it doesn't really know what to do with a Boolean value because this, this false, is, this toggle is a Boolean value. It doesn't understand that. So what I'm actually going to do is uh, this. Okay, so that worked. So um, after this button, then I'm going to display this this Boolean value. Um, question mark mean it uh, starts a ternary expression. So there is so so first it's a Boolean value, and then question mark. If this Boolean value is true, then return that guy, and if not, then re return that guy. So start with the so. Okay, so right now, uh, toggled is false. So if you look at uh, toggled, it's showing false. So so it says, okay, toggled is false. So I'm going to display the guy after the colon, which is off. Um, does that make sense? I know I introduced like a bunch of really crazy syntax that you might not have seen before. Um, any, anyone totally lost here? Or? Okay. So, if you can click this button and you can make it say on and then off, and then on and then off, and then on and then off, then uh, you've pretty much completed step one of your React knowledge. Yeah. So, could you like change the headers as well as with that button? Or? Yeah, so, uh, sure. I can definitely do that. So, I can say something like, so if I put it here, toggled, and then this ternary, display this string, hello, food sandbox, and then uh, the colon, and then a new thing like uh, hi, Matt, I don't know. Um, now if I click this button, then it, it changes uh, that thing too. I was actually going to uh, change the button text itself, which I think is also interesting. So now I can say like toggled. This button is on. This button is off. Right. Um, well. So I'm reusing that same piece of state three times. I'm, 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 every time React decides to re-render this component, this app, then it it takes that toggled and it runs this function and it says, "Okay, um, I gotta put false there," and then I say, "Okay." It's going to say, hi, Matt, and I put false there, and I say, okay, I'm going to render inside this button the text this button is off, and then I put false there, and I say, okay, I'm going to render the text off. Um, yeah. Is this all one component, or or is each, like, angled bracket, like, one component? So, um, in the React parlance, this is one component, because a component is, it's, it's like a defined block um, that uh, starts with a capital letter. And, and the reason why that distinction is made is because the lowercase letters are just raw HTML that then gets uh, rendered out to the, to the browser. Um, these, um, these capital letters, and I'll, I'll show the, the next step is going to be to create our own components. Um, then, then we'll have multiple components. You know, then you know. Again, you can have like nested components. You can, you can totally uh, go crazy with components. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Um, so I think I had another slide for. Okay, so so that was that's actually where I was going next. Um, you can create your own components for reuse. Um, for, for, I'm about to show you like a new component that we make, uh, more of a generalized button um, that we can use. Uh, you can use other people's components, um, and then you can parameterize those components uh, using something called props. So if I go in here, and I create a new function, um, button, and then I just say props for now. Uh, 
and that can say return a button, and then I say props.text, and then a button. And then I can also go in here and I can say style uh, color props.color. So React will pass in a bunch of different props. So props is like an object. Um, it's like a dictionary of a bunch of different things, uh, or whatever I want, really. So now I, if I add a button, a button with a capital B, and then I say color is red, and then text is hello, or I'll just say hello. I feel like I'm using hello too much. Um, yeah, add an align break just as, as you can see. Um, So the, I gave it a button with a capital B, and so React says, okay, that's a new component. That's like a totally new thing. Um, I'm going to take this function button, um, and I'm going to run this, this component uh, with that guy. So from there, so, so now that I know what a button is, then I can pass down these props that I gave. So I said color equals red, text is yellow. And then I said, okay, inside this props, uh, I gotta take props dot color. That's that's an object with a key and a value. So so props dot color gives you the value red, and then props dot text gives you the text yo. Um, so with that, I get to parameterize and reuse all these components. So you can imagine I could have another button with like button color blue text is. Uh, And then now I, I just, just like that, I create a whole button. Um, yeah, it's not quite as useful if you're just creating one thing, but like if you're creating a bunch of different, you know, if, say this is like a really complicated style that you, you want to compute, um, or say, you know, it, 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 it's this whole tree, right? I can, I can, I can put in a bunch of different subcomponents inside this component. I can go crazy, really. Um, does that make sense? So uh, components let you reuse uh, the same code uh, over and over. We are computer scientists. We like code reuse. That's the big thing. Um, another thing I can do is I can uh, give this guy its own toggled state. So I can go in here. I can say toggled uh, just like this. I can copy uh, the on click function. It'll, it'll just say the same. Um, so just like this, and then I can say, I can uh, give it like an on text and an alt text. So if it's on, on text, alt text is, and then give it an on text, an alt text. And then I can say toggle prop stop on text props dot off text. Um, so you'll notice that this button is on, but these two are off. And so these have different uh, pieces of state. So this outer uh, app component has a piece of state um, that's, that's affecting this. And these inner guys also have their own state. Um, and and you know, this, the, the two buttons can have the different pieces of state. Um, so that guy's off, but this guy's on, and uh, yada yada. So um, also a really neat way to sort of Containerize everything, um, make everything reusable. Um, I also wanted to show you really quick how you would do an input. Um, so, so I'm going to create a new piece of state. 
we're going to start, uh, the default value for this piece of state is going to be an empty string. And then I just gave the name user input, and then I gave its setter function set user input. Um, and if I go ahead and I add a new input, um, so this is an HTML input. Uh, you, to, to do this, you need two different things. You need the value. So it needs to know what the value currently is. I'm going to say it's user input, that piece of state that I just made. And then uh, on change, uh, this is also a little complicated. Uh, I'll type it out and then I'll explain it. Um, um, uh, put another line break here. Okay, so this is a text box I can type into now. Um, So I need to tell React every time it sh uh, an item changes that the value has changed. Um, and so it stores the actual text value of this input field inside the user input variable. And then when, I, when the browser generates an on change event for this input text box, it's going to generate this event. Um, so that, that's represented in the E variable. So, so you can see E has the type change event uh, for an input element. Um, and then E.target will get the actual input. And then E.target.value will read that value from the input. Um, this is a very complicated sort of reasoning why we have to do it this way. Um, but basically, to make sure that we can store the value of this input, we need to be able to uh, catch this event as it comes out of the browser um, and it goes back into React. Uh, and then re-render, when, when this, this whole application gets re-rendered, um, it will now be re-rendered with that value still preserved. Um, uh, the, the, the reasoning for that, you know, it, it's a, it's a complicated thing. It's a little, um, it's not super important when you're just getting started to, to understand why that is the case. But now that I have this user input in a string, they can go ahead and I can uh, start using that value elsewhere on my page. So let's say, let's say I make this uh, second level header the value of that user input. So again, to do that, I put it inside the brackets to tell React, hey, I want the value of that there, not like the literal string user input, but the actual value of that input there. And then I can uh, start typing. And now uh, the application gets updated with the new input of that string. Um, are there any questions there? I, I know I just want to do the whole ton of things. Okay, so the main takeaways that I want you to have about React is that, um, okay, so uh, I'll just go through slides again, why not? Uh, React is functional, it let, it's composed uh, by a bunch of nested function calls that could generate this whole tree of things. So we, we have a pretty shallow tree, we only have an application and then two buttons under the application, but you can imagine a tree that is however big you want. Um, React is a core display logic. Um, React doesn't really do the things that like you want it to do when it comes to um, like changing values, uh, uh, calculating new, new things. We'll talk a little bit uh, in just a few moments about uh, a React-ish way to do that. Um, React uses JSX, that angle bracket syntax. Uh, that's not real JavaScript, but uh, when you go and actually build a uh, React application, you have something in the middle that translates that JSX into JavaScript that your own browser knows. Uh, React is modular, uh, so you can reuse a bunch of components. Um, you can use other people's components. Um, and then you just change the parameters of those components using your properties or props. And finally, React is declarative. Um, 
that's kind of the thing that's made it so popular at this point. Um, React is a single point of truth about what your app, the structure of your app actually is. So um, this, this component tree here, it doesn't really change. Right? You write it once, and then it's there. What changes it is the app speed. So um, if you've used JavaScript before, you might have used something called jQuery. Or you might just use plain JavaScript, where you're like constantly like getting things out of the browser, you're changing them around, and then putting them back. Uh, that can generate a lot of bugs, um, especially if you don't like account for every single different piece of like what could be there, what could be there in the browser, and what is there in the browser. Um, React sort of helps you uh, worry about or, or, or not worry about all those different mutations that you have to do. Uh, it, it takes care of uh, what is actually in the browser versus what you want to be in the browser. Um, and it does it efficiently, too. It does it, it, it if, the um, cool thing about this is if the state of a button changes, all it has to do is re-render this, this little button. It doesn't have to re-render the entire application. And that's, that's like a nice little shortcut that React can take. Um, and, and for that, it keeps your... Uh, your whole application running pretty smoothly. Um, are there any questions about that? So, so I think that's sort of the, the big hallmark of, of like why React has become so popular is that it's sort of eliminated this whole class of bugs that arise when you're worried about doing mutations and changes to things in the browser. Uh, where instead you can have, you can say, this is my app, this is my state, make it work. <laughs> um, so, Let's talk a little bit about state. I'll well, take a swig of water here. Um, so to uh, accomplish state, um, you know, previously we were using um, these use state things, and this is a nice little convenient thing that React has for you. And this is very useful, and, and you can definitely build a whole app without even touching what I'm about to show you. But um, there's also something really useful about having a global state, having a single uh, point of truth about your state, and having a single point of tr truth about your app, combining those two together. Uh, Redux helps you. It's like that other piece of the puzzle for that. So Re Redux creates that app state for you, and then React will combine it with your component tree to produce an item in the browser. Um, if you've ever studied uh, discrete one, then you might know about uh, discrete finite, discrete finite automaton. Um, Redux is kind of like that. Um, it's Redux itself is also functional, um, so uh, you can. So so your job is to define this function called reduce. And reduce takes in your current application state and a new action to perform. And then from there, it creates a new state. Um, so and I'll show you in a minute of what a very small example will be. Um, Redux is actually standalone for React. You don't need to use it with React. You can use it in other sorts of applications. But it's also easily integrated into React. Uh, that's the reason why it's gotten popular, too. Um, so. If you want to go ahead and open up the second link, so it's the same bit.ly slash and then capital M, ATT, two capital H's, and a two. So just like the last link you did, except it's a two now instead of a one. Okay. Um, So right now you see an empty screen. Um, that's interesting. I kind of expected not that. Let's see. Ah, there it is. Okay. Funny. Um, so uh, we can start on app.js real quick. Um, this is actually already totally written for you. Um, actually, we're going to modify it a little bit. But um, 
let's start with the state .js instead. Um, so I, I've already created the function for you, reduce. Uh, it's we're going to create an application that lets you count numbers up. So I have this increment button and this decrement button, and we want to create an application that lets us uh, change that number there. So for our application state, it's actually just going to be one single value, and that's going to be this number here. So that's zero there. Um, and implement reduce. To do that, I'm going to take in an action. So I'm going to say if action.type is increment, then I'm just going to return state plus one. So does that kind of make sense? Of that, that's like a function that takes in a state and an action. And so this action's type is to increment something. And so my new state is going to be, OK, uh, whatever my current state is plus one. Um, at this in this function definition, um, I have the state equals zero. That's going to be your default state now. Uh, so if I hit save on that, um, freeze it again. Uh, then I go ahead and I hit the synchronize button. Hey, it works. Um, and so I can talk a little bit more about what app.js is doing. So here, uh, application is receiving as properties the count and the increment function. And so when this button is clicked, then it runs the increment function. And all this increment function is, is it's, it's being put in here. It's telling uh, Redux to uh, create this new action uh, with the type of increment. And then Redux knows how to take it from there. And it says, OK, uh, I'm just going to feed into this reducer uh, this new state, um, or my current state, which is 0, and then the action to increment. And then it's going to run this function. It's going to return state plus 1. And then once that's complete, then Redux says, OK, now this count has been up, or now this, my state has been updated. So I'm going to pass into this application component uh, the count variable. Um, and that's going to be redisplayed onto the screen. Um, so how that works. Does anyone have any questions here? Yeah, cool. Um, I'm running a little short on time, so I might not do the other two buttons, but actually I'll do one for you. So we're going to say if action.type is now decrement, and we return state minus one. Yes. So, like, are you like implementing listeners or something to listen to the button presses? Or? So, uh, the listeners are already created with this uh, on click okay. uh, part of the button, and so. OnClick uses the property passed in from uh, Redux to actually be that listener. Um, and so right now it dispatches that increment button, or that increment event. So now I can create a new uh, function for this. So I'll say decrement. Um, this is a new function. It takes no arguments, and then it's going to dispatch uh, something of type. Decrement. Yeah. And finally, I need to make sure that I also pass in, I actually read that property in, and then I say on click. I'm going to decrement. So if I save there, I should get one, two, three. That's why I misspelled something here. Oh, let's see. Okay, there we go. I'm not sure what was wrong. Right. I think it just didn't reload. Um, yeah. 
So, and then you can imagine a third state where we actually set, um, you know, let's just do that one too. So if action dot type is set, so I could say set, I could have an action called set to five, but then what if I want to set it to six or something? Um, that would be silly to have multiple uh, action types for that. So I, I return uh, action dot payload. So if I want to set to five, then I can create this new function uh, set. Uh, and then this function is actually going to take a parameter, I'm going to say n, and then dispatch type is set, and then uh, payload itself is n. So now uh, on click, I'm going to run this function, which is got to call set five. Um, and then I got to make sure I'm also passing in that property. Make sure I save everything here. Uh, so now my dec increment works, my decrement works, and then I can also, oh. Ah, uh, you know what, set is a reserved word. this part of my cheat sheet. Okay. Uh, then we can just comment that out and move on. <laughs> um, but uh, in general, um, Redux sort of, sort of elevates your state away from having the state in each component um, and instead uh, puts your state into, into this global state that I can then uh, modify here. Uh, so now I have a single point of truth for my app. Single point of truth for my state. Um, really useful stuff. Uh, I have a little diagram here to show you. Here's the single point of truth for my uh, app coming in. Here's the single point of truth for my state coming in. Uh, Redux, or sorry, React renders it all, puts it out into the browser. The browser generates these actions that come back into the reducer function. Uh, Redux itself combines your state, your old state, and your new actions to create a new state and the cycle continues. Um, it's, uh, it, it, this is, it, it may seem kind of complicated, it solves a bunch of problems that arise when you have a really complicated uh, application. Um, are there any questions there? Cool. Um, so finally, WebSockets. Uh, so if you take in internet technology, you might know that a WebSocket is something that allows for two-way communication. So that's just a normal socket. Uh, web sockets are that on the web. So um, rather than being between two different like processes on your computer, a web socket is between two different servers, um, two, uh, yeah. So, so it's, it's a socket that you learn about in systems or in uh, internet technology, except over the internet. So the, the the problem that this solves is that you can now push info from a server back down to the web browser itself. So this is a great, great innovation for real-time applications. Um, they're different from HTTP. Um, to actually initiate a WebSocket connection, the browser first sends an HTTP request to the WebSocket. The WebSocket says, hi, I am a WebSocket, so please uh, let's switch the protocol and let's go over to the WebSocket protocol. And then from there, the server and the client maintain this connection that they communicate over uh, using uh, TCP, um, which is something you might have learned about in systems. Um, if, if you haven't learned about that in systems, then, uh, take systems. It's our class, but I think it's also good. Um, WebSockets are independent of any framework. They're built right into the browser. Um, so. I had this demo plan for kind of how we can um, implement uh, sockets into the uh, Redux state. Uh, instead of jumping 
instead of like live doing that demo, how about we instead uh, just jump right to the solution? So here's what we pre we prepared at home. You just type finish here. <laughs> um, so let's see. So if someone else navigates to this URL and opens it up, um, then they can also start <coughs> chatting in this same room uh, that I have set up here. Um, and this is going to be like really cool. I, I, I'm just going to show you how to uh, create your own uh, chat room that no one else will use. So, um, so it, if someone else. Hopefully, this works. Um, ah, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I might be regretting uh, putting your comments up right on the screen, but let's let's uh, walk through really quickly what's going on here. Um, Hello there. So, uh, so, so this is the socket file. Um, this creates a new uh, web socket right here. Um, you can look at the back end for that. Um, it's, it's not super important how this, this demo works. Um, we, we set it up so that uh, we have a ping. Um, a socket does close after like five minutes of inactivity. So every minute we just say, hey, I'm still alive. Um, when we send a message, when we want to send a message, then we just write into that socket uh, the, the message of the actual payload. And when we receive a message, then what we do is we tell Redux that we got a new message. So now Redux holds a state for um, the, the actual stuff in this uh, web chat. And, and then Redux is responsible for displaying that back out to Redux and Reactor is responsible for displaying it back out to the screen. So real quick, if we look at the state, uh, the state is kind of simple. Um, I can I can change my own name. I can also change. Uh, I can also I can also add a new message. So every time a new message comes in, uh, this Redux state changes on here. And then finally, for the application, um, I just have some stuff inside here to detect when you hit enter in the message field, and then um, I just have. I, I just display all the messages as they come in. Um, I definitely uh, uh, encourage you to uh, read through the code a little bit and, and definitely reach out to me with any questions. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't, uh, I didn't have the time to, to fully show you how this all works. But um, the takeaway I want you to take is that uh, WebSockets allow you to have a continuous communication between my the, the the client and the server. So my client doesn't have my web browser doesn't have to keep asking the server, hey, where are the new messages? Instead, when General Kenobi said you, uh, my <laughs> server said, hey, there's a new message for you here, display on the screen. And, and then and then my client says, okay, I got a new message. I know how to, I have to display that message. Um, it's a really cool feature. It, it, it lets you have an actual real time. Feature. Um, are there any questions there about WebSockets in general? Cool. Um, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I got, I, got, I got to get back to my diagrams here. Um, so, so both UI events, like when you hit enter um, or when you change your nickname, then that goes into the Redux state and also an event from the socket also goes into the Redux state, updates the application state, and then React says, hi, I have a new state. Uh, I know how to, what to do with that state. I'm going to put it into the browser. Um, so again, it's this like closed loop. Um, I don't have to worry about changing things in the browser. I just uh, have React do that for me. So um, to finally put it all together, I want to show you a demo of how we use, uh, how we use React. So this is our application right here. Um, I right now have a simulator running of the actual airplane. 
Um, and I can go in here and I can import a new mission. So here's a mission. I can um, connect to the judges server. I couldn't get the judges server to run at this moment. Um, I was kind of scrambling to get this demo together, actually, but uh, it, it, it all works. Um, <laughs> fingers crossed. Uh, but inside, I can add my own obstacles to this. So if I add a new obstacle, then I can go in here and I can uh, drag it around and put it in a new spot. And then I can go to my waypoints and I can say, hey, avoid all the obstacles for me. And then it, it plans a new path around that. Wow. Um, and finally, I can say uh, drone. I can upload the waypoints that we have to the drone. And then I can go into our heads up display. Um, unfortunately, I can't arm it from here. I think there, there's a little bug with uh, how it understands if the thing is armed. So I'll just go into the simulation and I'll arm it myself. Um, so now the plane is armed. All I need to do now is switch it into auto mode. It's set mode. Oh, did it work? Maybe not. Uh, okay, so auto. Or mode auto. Okay, it's, uh, that, that didn't work either. But now we're getting live updates about the plane's attitude uh, and altitude and stuff into this uh, simulation here. Or, well, the, this is the real application. The simulation is running to uh, give us this information. I can go back to the map and we can see the plane start to fly through these waypoints as well. Wow. Um, yeah, so, you know, this, this whole thing gets pretty complicated. I have, like, a table of all the waypoints that we generated. Um, you can imagine that, like, oh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, all right, we might need to work that out. But, um... Yeah, so uh, th there's a lot of different stuff going on here, right? There, there's the map to avoid the obstacles. There's the display logic to, to show that heads-up display. There's, um, you know, all the stuff that goes into building this map view. Um, one thing that was nice is that because I was using 3D React, I could take and map a component library and actually use this map. Um, I didn't have to worry about, like, doing the math on, like, the like, coordinates to actually display this. Um, yeah. So, uh, Re React lets you sort of manage the complexity of, of such a large scale app like this, and and this really isn't even that large scale. Yeah. Do you have to plug in all the waypoints individually? Um, so this was a. Uh, uh, so that's something we want to work on. Actually, that's something that we're definitely uh, fixing up for next year. Is, um, or well, the, the competition in June, um, is like. Also, to generate this creative waypoint, so this is a sort of a Zamboni path to uh, take images of the ground. Um, so another task is to take images of the ground and then identify targets in those images. Um, and so to do that, we need to snake across the ground to, 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 to survey the whole field. Um, so I want to build a system that like does the math to actually do that. And, we, and we've, we've actually done that. We just need to integrate it into this application. Um, and then also things like, you know, there are only four runways, so we can probably create our kickoff sequences in advance. Um, you know, we won't know how the wind is until we get there, so we want to decide which runway is like the best to take off from. Then, you know, ideally we just say, okay, well, we only have 15 minutes, but we can say, okay, I'm taking off from here. You know, this is what the, the uh, judges gave us for the obstacles and for the path to fly through. Uh, let's generate a whole mission of great points. Uh, really fun competition. Um, uh, I, you know, I'd really encourage you to get involved in something like this, be it our club or um, another thing. It really lets you stand out. Um, it really lets you practice your skills in building an application like this. Um, are there any questions about, about this guy or about uh, anything that we talked about tonight? Um, or, oh, no, it's not. Yeah, okay. um, so where you can find us or me, um, our website is nwa.rutgers.edu. That's, again, for the whole umbrella organization. We have three competition teams. Our team is called Ari Autonomous. Uh, we meet Mondays at 8.30 p.m. 
um, in the D one two three big lab in the engineering building. So um, it's this it's this big room that has a bunch of sub rooms in it. We're actually up the stairs uh, it, it, of this thing that we call the mezzanine um, engineering building. Of course, being that like big one. Yeah, I think. I think <coughs> Hopefully you can find us if, if you're curious to stop by. Uh, and then you can also reach me by email right there. Uh, anything else?